As you know, we have covered world history in a total of three series so far and brought it to a certain point. To what point have we brought it? We have brought it up to the 600s just before the spread of Islam. Now, starting from 600,000 years before Christ and bringing it up to the year 600, we have touched on trade in small ways in some places, but we need to understand the topic of trade and economy correctly. This is important because there will be a total of 22 videos over the next 18 videos, and this is the fourth one that has been properly evaluated. The size of countries depends on the vitality of their economies. This is because the larger an empire grows, such as the Roman Empire or the Ottoman Empire, the more difficult it becomes to manage that land. Because so many people need to be fed, and so many people naturally need to earn income from agriculture, livestock, and some form of trade to satisfy their needs. There is a second issue as well. If you are to rule the world, your army also needs to be sustained. Because managing large territories means that an army must constantly advance. Moreover, as you advance, you will need to leave the army in certain places along the way. In other words, you cannot simply say, I have conquered this land, it is mine now. That place will rebel. Therefore, as you progress, your army grows. As you advance, your army expands. But what will sustain that army? Since the army does not engage in agriculture, if it sows wheat while on the move, it cannot reap the benefits a year or two later. Therefore, a growing economy and expanding territory have always been a source of trouble. In this video, I will take you back to before history and bring you up to the Industrial Revolution all the way to the 16th century. After that, the video will follow its own course. Let's see what the economy is all about, how money came into existence and what it has been used for. Let's get started. Welcome. In 2000 BC, Anatolia was under the rule of the Assyrians. So why is the place we now call Anatolia so important? Why aren't we talking about other places? Because the weight of life at that time, in the 2000s BC, was in Anatolia. The Assyrians were governing a large piece of land, the more a territory is under the control of the same empire, civilization, people, or even republic, the more secure that vast area is. What does it mean to be safe for the economy? For example, I start my journey from Vanand, can transport my product all the way to Izmir, as long as it is not looted on the way, I am safe. Owning an empire means that your merchants can safely progress along those routes. On the trade routes, this strengthens the economy. Because merchants pay taxes, facilitate trade, exchange wheat for, let's say, a work of art or fabric, and thus create prosperity. The more prosperity there is in the country, people access wheat and fill their stomachs, the less trouble there is. Therefore, having strong trade and ensuring the security of trade networks were very important for the Assyrians. It was so important that they built places, which we can actually call the first caravanserais, where people could progress during the day and stay overnight. These places ensured that people could trade safely. Do you know where their center was? In Nesha? You will be surprised now. Where was Nesha? It was Kultepe in Kayseri. So actually, the center of world trade at that time was Kayseri. That's why today, the people of Kayseri are so advanced in trade. The farthest thing coming to Kayseri, specifically from the Nesha market at that time, was arriving from a distance of 1,200 kilometers. The marketplaces were vibrant because the products coming from such long distances were naturally protected and secured along the way. All these commercial activities, were recorded in a place called Bitkarim in Nesha. There was a ledger there. And when you brought something and sold it, if you didn't want to take all your money, you would write it in the ledger there. And when you came again, you would spend from that ledger. Or exchanges could be made with others through a ledger. Think of it like today's Bitcoin. In other words, you weren't carrying cash with you. Why? Because the money of that time was made of silver and gold. Now imagine you are selling something very valuable. Carrying silver and gold a thousand kilometers away is a heavy burden, which could be attacked at a rate of 2%. So, while all the empires protect you, if gold and silver are in very large amounts, it becomes a heavy burden on you and difficult to carry. Therefore, Bitcoin was keeping these accounts. These trades were so important that they dated back to BC. In 1760, Hammurabi, the king of Babylon, enacted the Hammurabi laws to regulate trade and ensure that no one stole from anyone else to protect merchants from harm and to ensure that merchants acted honestly. But what about money? 
Did money really not exist? I mean, were people giving cows in exchange for apples? Because think about it. If you need 10 apples, what are you going to do? Cut off the cow's ear? No. In both the Hittite and Assyrian civilizations, specifically in Hattusa, for the Hittites and in Assyria or Babylon, there was a currency known as sugar. It was very close to money. The logic behind it was silver bars. The silver bars of the Hittites weighed 12.5 grams. Our question weighs 8.3 grams. Therefore, there is a certain exchange rate difference, isn't there? Because no matter what, these nations were trading with each other, even waging wars from time to time. And a sheep was used as a standard. A sheep always weighed a certain amount. That is, it was 12.5 grams. In Hittite, you could buy a sheep for one shekel. But when you crossed over to the Assyrian side, they valued it at 1.5 Assyrian shekels, which is a ratio of 8.3 to 12.5. A sheep was purchased for 1.5 shekels. Therefore, there was no exchange rate difference. Everything was progressing in trade quite steadily based on the sheep mentality of 12.5 grams of gold. There is something important here. Yes, these silver bars were used in trade, but the problem was here. Those silver bars were not guaranteed by the state. This was because no one could guarantee the purity of the silver. Other substances could be mixed in. There was generally a standard unit of measurement. Candies were measured against it and used if they were safe. But of course, there was a lot of fraud. Did you know that even today's coins have been tampered with later on? Because the edges of those coins were being scraped off to steal from their weight. That's why notches were made around them to prevent the coins from being stolen. Even though today's coins are not made of precious metals, those ridges still continue. Silver, BC. It started to be used commercially around 3000, but it existed around 5000. Because when you look at the 4000s to 5000s BC, there are silver objects. However, the separation of lead in Anatolia occurred around the 3000s BC. Silver was not common in the Egyptian empire or on Egyptian lands, and it was considered more valuable than gold. But remember, gold is older than everything, meaning gold has always been gold. In the 2500s BC, the Chinese were prominent with silver. In ancient times, the Greeks were very wealthy in terms of silver. This was because they excelled in trade, particularly by producing wine from grapes and selling olive oil, olives and olive products, thereby accumulating silver from the world. They placed great importance on precious metals. Spain was also yielding to Greece until the Spaniards began to steal silver from Mexico, which was so abundant that one could swim in it, as I will explain towards the end of the video. The Greeks may not have ruled over very large territories, but the wine from their lands, which was the most valuable thing at that time, along with olive oil, was significant. They were bringing silver into the country by selling other countries. Now, land trade is problematic, but the Greeks had ports around the Mediterranean with Greek colonies. Therefore, the Greeks were engaged in maritime trade. Since it was a closed sea, piracy was not very prevalent. Later, you will see that pirates will emerge in large numbers. One of the pirates that shook Italy, Greece, and even Malta the most was Barbarossa Hayreddin Pasha. He later took command of the Ottoman fleet. However, during that period, merchant ships were very comfortable. Therefore, transporting goods by sea was much faster and easier than through the ports, which allowed money to flow into their economies very quickly. In 650 BC, King Gyges of Lydia was actually producing the closest mentality to modern money. Let's not say that money was found now. It is a bit silly to say that the Lydians invented money, but they developed it because they are standardizing gold. It takes the shape of a coin, prints its image on it, and the gold has a value equal to its weight, meaning it holds a value equivalent to the amount of gold in that round shape. Therefore, all gold coins were issued with the same weight, under state guarantee. A hundred years later, during the reign of King Croesus, both gold and silver coins were issued, and when a certain amount of silver coins were gathered, they functioned like the small change of gold. This is a wonderful system. Why? Because in history, there were more single metal currency systems based on either silver or gold. But during the reign of King Croesus, around 550 BC, things improved. And there were now also coins made of silver. And then the Roman Empire that I mentioned to you emerges. The Roman Empire has such vast territories that it needs to be constantly at war. It is assumed by historians that three quarters of the population went to war constantly. So, who are these men? 
The legionnaires are fighting with the money that has turned into Halibi against the barbarians and whatnot, but the real warriors are the farmers, landowners, and peasants. Now these peasants were selling their lands because they would be going to very distant places as the wheat would rot by the time they returned if they planted it there. Someone would already plunder the land, therefore they were selling these lands. So who were the buyers? They were the wealthy who were close to the Roman Senate, that is, the government, who openly liked to seize land and wanted to expand their territory, monopolizing it. They were people close to the administration. These people, when they were in the hands of the peasants, had small plots of land that barely fed them, but as these people consolidated their lands, they gained more area and added more varieties and products. And of course, their aim was to be sold in large markets. The lands that once fed the hungry had now become a power in the hands of merchants. These lands were called latifundia. In the past, peasants worked on their own, in the latifundia, but now, these land barons were employing slaves. They were employing people who were war spoils taken from the places they plundered in the Mediterranean to work on these lands. The labor was free. In other words, free labor and vast lands made it very comfortable for the Roman Empire, as the Mediterranean had essentially become a Roman lake. Around the 5th century AD, Caesar minted a gold coin worth 100 silver coins, which indicates how strong their economy was. What happened next? The Roman Empire was tired of fighting and could no longer expand. They began to collapse commercially because the number of soldiers fighting had decreased and thus war spoils were no longer coming in. Since people were not engaged in agriculture, they couldn't tax farming. When the soldiers returned to their lands, they tried to return to agriculture. They raised the taxes. Since we cannot generate income from war, let's collect taxes from farming. When agriculture became unprofitable, migration to the city began. The migration from the countryside to the city also reduced the labor force in the city. There was a growing inclination towards such crafts, but agriculture began to face difficulties. This marked the end of the Roman economy. Consequently, Roman currency started to lose its value. The Western Roman Empire disappeared in the 470s AD. The Eastern Roman Empire had some issues because of this. In the last video, I didn't say that the Eastern Roman Empire called itself the Byzantine Empire. I mentioned that we refer to the Eastern Roman Empire as Byzantium. The area we refer to as the Eastern Roman Empire was a central structure in Istanbul. Let's call it Byzantium now. They placed great importance on agriculture, livestock and fishing. At the same time, since they were settled, they were not as warlike anymore. They were good at textiles as well, just like they were with the West. Silk, which you know is also present in Bursa today, along with silk production and carpet weaving, brought a lot of money to the budget of the Roman Empire. The problem was that the money earned was being taken away by Venetian and Genoese merchants. Now these Venetian and Genoese merchants are making so much profit that they start lending to the Byzantines, when the economy begins to decline from the port known as Constantinople, which we actually call Istanbul, and from the port of Izmir. When the Byzantines were unable to pay these debts, they sought commercial privileges and capitulations. The capitulations that the Ottomans would grant several centuries later had already been given to the Eastern Roman Empire by the Byzantines. In fact, the wedding calamity that troubled the Ottomans also applies equally to Byzantium. Paper money first appeared in China during the seventh century under the Tang Dynasty. But it is not a paper currency issued by the government, that is, the state, the king, or the dynasty. It is the promissory notes signed by merchants among themselves to guarantee the exchange, stating things like, this man owes me this much, or I received this much money. These notes could be transferred among merchants. I need to explain this. You must understand what endorsement is. Today, you can transfer a check or a promissory note to someone else by writing your name on the back. Or, you can take over a transfer. For example, I have a check in my hand. I received it from person A. He guarantees that he will pay me the money one day next year. If I go and give that check to Mehmet, I am transferring it to him by writing my name on the back. My debt to him is passed on. He will go and collect the money from him when the time comes. Here, in the dynasty, the logic of paper money in the Tank dynasty was also based on these types of promissory notes, a check or promissory note. But remember, the government, the kingdom, and the dynasty did not guarantee its payment. And therefore, it was local. In other words, it was useful among Chinese merchants who knew each other. Otherwise, these currencies were not very useful in places like France, Europe, or Germany. I will take you back to the Roman Empire. Why? Feudalism. Feudalism 
Understanding feudalism is very, very important because it is generally perceived as a very negative term, and indeed it is a bad word. Feodum, that is the selling of people bound to a piece of land. Now, as things worsened in Rome and hunger began to set in, slaves started to be freed. In other words, they no longer wanted to be responsible for their throats. The slave is freed, but it is not simply a matter of saying, go on, leave. He says, there is a piece of land over there, slave. From now on, go live there. I won't give you any food or anything. But you will cultivate that land. You will not go anywhere else from there. And after the crops grow from that land, you will eat as much as you need to live, and you will give the rest to me. Tax, land rent. These people were not called slaves, but there was a category known as serfs that existed between slavery and freedom. Serfs were sold along with the land. Feudal land ownership transformed into an economic model. Where? First in France and Germany. In the 10th century, France and Germany established feudalism as a very powerful economic system. Shortly after, England followed. They also incorporated colonialism into feudalism. In other words, they began to exploit very distant lands in this way. But that is a completely separate topic. Feudalism continued for four or five centuries, if we include the 15th century. In other words, it dominated the world for a long time. This was because the power of land nobility was increasingly growing. You were merging some lands, placing a mansion in the middle. And over time, this mansion transformed into a fortress, similar to computer products, eventually evolving into a strong land management system. And even small countries, by maintaining their own mercenaries to defend a specific region. Later, there were feudal lords who declared their independence and waged war against the government and the kingdom, as seen in Game of Thrones. These were later referred to as lords. This is where the title of lord originated. Do you know who the greatest lord in this system was? I mean the largest landowner in the feudal system. It was the Catholic Church. Before the year 1100, being a merchant was considered quite a lowly profession. Especially during the Roman period, merchants were not very well regarded. They were seen as the lower class of society. Slaves would come first, followed by merchants. However, the rise of merchants began between 1100 and 1300. Merchants had become so valuable that they provided employment, hiring others to work alongside them. In fact, one of the factors that contributed to the decrease in slavery was these merchants. At first, they traded slaves, but then they realized that they constantly needed people to protect themselves in maritime trade. They began to pay these individuals a salary, and the marketplaces. Large marketplaces later transformed into fairs in 1174. The fairgrounds were so vast that they became a place where international traders came to exchange rare and interesting goods for an extended period. It was so big that it would create its own banking system. I will explain shortly. But we have fairs in Istanbul and Izmir. They are generally close to the ports because goods come from the world, so they are always near the port. In fact, the Eiffel Tower was there for the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution in Paris in 1789. On the anniversary, a fair is being set up in such a great France in Paris that the entrance gate becomes the Eiffel Tower. Imagine, those fairs were so prestigious. There are various symbols left by the fairs for the world. The Eiffel Tower is one of them. 1120 is a turning point for the world. Why? Because the Venetian merchants who traveled to China had those pieces of paper from the Tang dynasty. They are examining these closely and calling it a great idea, saying we should take it to Europe. First, France and Germany will love it, and then England. Venetian merchants are establishing a banking system. Why? Because the marketplaces are very large and the fairgrounds are very large. And these are also behind the tables. Banco. So the word bank comes from here. Among these banks, they exchange guarantees of paper pieces saying this one sold this to that one and that one sold that to this one. And they defend the bank management with the first money, writing down debts and credits. Thus, the word bank comes from here. Where does banknote come from? the note given by the Italians, and Venetians, banco nota, nota di banco, banknote, or banknote, which is a piece of paper that shows you are the owner of money, is also called a banknote. This spreads very quickly because one, it is not heavy to carry like coins. Two, even if you are robbed, since the paper is in your name, what is stolen does not actually disappear if you haven't circulated it, like pure money or under pressure. It is easy to store. You can hide a piece of paper, but let's say you cannot hide a sack of gold or silver. Thus, paper money is spreading rapidly. Europe's misfortune was the emergence of the Mongols just when everything was going well. 
The Mongols are spreading so quickly that they are massacring 24 million people. The world population is rapidly decreasing. Just think, only a third of London's population remains. In other words, even they are dying in this war. Because they are indirectly spreading the plague to the world. So you might ask, did the Mongols go and invade England? No. But if I am not mistaken, Genghis Khan's second degree cousin is using a catapult to throw his own soldiers who died of the plague into the castle to conquer a stronghold. The Venetian merchants who escaped from here are carrying the bubonic plague to Europe by sea, and the plague, known as the Black Death, is rapidly reducing the population of Europe. It is estimated that a total of 40 million people died, aside from its periodic effects. This, of course, rapidly reduces the number of traders and those engaged in agriculture around the world. A decrease in the world population means a reduction in agriculture, product diversity, customers, and money as well. What is the impact of this? Hungry people cannot adapt to the feudal system and are rebelling. Feudalism comes to an end around the 16th century. Now another thing begins between the 14th and 16th centuries. Geographical discoveries, the Spaniards, the Portuguese, the English, and then even the Dutch. They use the seas so cleverly for their geographical explorations that they quickly discover new places. They bring back spices and precious stones from these regions. But the biggest is of course the silver and gold of the Spaniards in Mexico. But silver is the main plunder. They bring so much silver to Spain. Everyone is starting to become wealthy in Spain. Now when a country suddenly acquires a lot of silver, the prices of goods increase. Because three days ago, when that merchant had insufficient money, you were willing to sell the sheep for the same amount. But now that he has a lot of silver, you are asking for more silver. As a result, the prices of everything start to rise. This is called inflation. Following this inflation, it quickly spreads to the rest of Europe. It even affects the Ottoman economy and even China within a hundred years. Do you know how it affects? Its effect is as follows. Now, if the public has more silver and the value of something, let's say a sheep used to be 12.5 grams of silver. Do you remember? Now they say it is 100 grams. The state has a treasury. In the state's treasury, there used to be, let's say, 100 tons of silver. Now, while 100 tons of gold used to be bought for 1 million coins, you can now only buy it for 100,000 coins. States suddenly became impoverished in their treasuries. Think of it this way. I am explaining it very simply. There is the Turkish lira. The central bank of the Republic of Turkey has plenty of Turkish lira. Suddenly, 100 TL equals $1. In an instant, the Turkish lira becomes very devalued. If the money the government has is in TL, the country would go bankrupt in an instant. But of course, the money in the bank is held in dollars. Therefore, this impoverishment and the rise in inflation increase the price of everything by exactly four times within just 100 years. In other words, prices increased fourfold in all places, extending to Europe and China. The unfortunate thing is that for 200 years, no one understood that this was due to the excessive circulation of silver in the market. The Spaniards were rich, but poor. The 1500s were marked by inflation, etc. It gave a lesson to Europe, and something called mercantilism emerged there. Mercantilism is one of the strongest economic systems that tried to govern the previous world in capitalism. Let's explain it and say goodbye. It has four philosophies. First, if you can produce something in your country, do not buy it from abroad. Because valuable minerals, let's say money, should not leave your country. Two, wherever there are valuable minerals, seize them. If you are going to occupy a place or go to war, there should be valuable minerals there. And they think they can exploit them. Three, the state will intervene in the economic life. An economy without the state does not function properly. 4. Imports should be restricted as much as possible, even banned, but exports should be encouraged. Now, in this short time, we said let's take a look at world trade in about 20-30 minutes. But of course, the Silk Road of the Chinese was very important for trade during that period. The continuous flow of spices from China to India and Europe allowed the Chinese to stay informed about the world while various goods were being sent back. At that time, both knowledge and maps were extremely valuable. These maps even contributed to the discovery of America. I am Haluk Tatar, and I wanted to provide an economic perspective on world history and also to examine the foundations of the economy. See you in the next video.